piece of furniture is more than a utilitarian object that makes our lives more comfortable. Furniture embodies a history of the social mores, philosophy, aesthetics, politics, economics, science, and technology of the period in which it was made. By preserving examples of furniture in museums, period environments, and in our own homes, we not only learn about our ancestors' world, but are also keepers of this knowledge for future generations. This video is about preserving furniture, or more correctly, about what you can do to minimize the preventable damage to furniture in your care. Preventable damage to furniture is usually caused by one of three things. First, and perhaps the most important, is a poorly controlled ambient environment. Second, is careless use, handling, and maintenance. And third, inadequate packing for transport or shipping. This video will briefly discuss the first two of these three aspects of preventable damage, beginning with the environment. There is an optimal environmental mix of light levels, temperature, and humidity for most things. For furniture, the perfect climate is about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, roughly 50% relative humidity, dark, and anaerobic. Obviously, this is not conducive to human use of the objects, so a reasoned compromise must be reached. Probably the easiest issue to resolve is damage from excessive light levels. What we normally call light is really just a very narrow portion of the phenomenon called electromagnetic radiation. Light interacts with everything it illuminates, and the amount of that interaction depends on the energy of the light, which is, in turn, dependent on the color of the light. Blue light is much more energetic than red, and thus more interactive or damaging to the surfaces of furniture. Light bleaches and degrades most components of furniture. Coatings, whether transparent or polychrome, the wood itself, and especially upholstery textiles. Dealing with these problems is relatively simple. When the furniture is not in use, it is best left in the dark. Even when in use and in the light, damage can be reduced through the utilization of curtains, window shades, and screens, which protect the furniture from direct sunlight, and UV filter films, which block the most damaging light frequencies. For extended non-use, such as storage, dust covers are recommended. If the furniture is subject to light while not in use, the dust cover should be opaque. As long as there is light, there will be light damage. But these simple measures can go a long way to reducing potential damage. Keep the curtains drawn and the blinds and shades closed. Use UV filter films on windows. And place opaque dust covers on the furniture when it's not in use. Perhaps the greatest microclimate damage to furniture occurs as the result of wide swings in the relative humidity. This damage occurs because wood is a material that swells or shrinks as the relative humidity rises and falls. It is not homogeneous, which means that it expands and contracts differently along different grain directions. This characteristic of wood exists regardless of its age whether it is freshly cut from a tree or is thousands of years old from an ancient tomb. Thus, as humidity changes, the components of wooden objects are continually pushing and pulling against each other. This often results in a phenomenon called compression set, whose most common manifestation is either parts of furniture that no longer fit together closely or parts of furniture that are distorted or broken from their own internal stresses. 
The wood in furniture is not the only thing to suffer from humidity swings. As they age, most coatings become more inflexible. Since the wood continues to move with humidity changes, and the coating becomes increasingly brittle with time, eventually humidity fluctuations will cause the coatings to begin fracturing and separating from the wood. This problem becomes particularly severe in cases where the coatings are likely to be less flexible from the start, such as some types of polychrome, or gilding, which is often applied over a rigid ground of plaster called gesso. The response to relative humidity changes begins with determining the annual average relative humidity for your particular climate. What you want to do is keep the relative humidity in the space where your furniture is as close to that average as possible. This can be achieved through your HVAC systems by dehumidifying in the summer and humidifying in the winter. Humidity and temperature have a rough inversion relationship. In other words, if you raise the temperature, you lower the humidity, and vice versa. Since much of the problem with furniture is a result of modern heating systems, which can drive down interior relative humidity in the winter, another option would be to modify the relative humidity by keeping furniture in cooler spaces in the wintertime. This can be done either manually, by turning down the thermostat, or automatically, with a device called a humidistat. Minimizing the damage from an unregulated environment can be accomplished by determining the local relative humidity average and monitoring the relative humidity in the furniture space using a device called a hygrothermograph and manipulating the relative humidity and temperature through your HVAC to achieve a stable environment. The third and often most overlooked environmental problem is biopredation or insect infestation, rodent damage, and rot. Insect infestation can destroy a collection of valued furniture in a short time. The best preventive measure to widespread damage is to monitor your collection regularly. If you see piles of insect excrement and wood dust, called frass, under or on your object, it could be an active infestation. Immediately quarantine the suspect object, and if the infestation is confirmed, fumigation will be necessary. Also, increase monitoring of nearby furniture, for the likelihood of further infestation is now greater. Rodents usually do not eat the wood for its own sake, but rather gnaw through it to get to the food on the other side. The best way to deal with this is to not store any foodstuffs, including condiments, in your furniture. Since food also attracts insects, it is a good idea to keep food as far from your collection as possible. Fungal damage, or rot, can only occur in areas of extreme dampness at moderate temperatures. Unless your furniture gets wet and stays wet, this is not normally a severe problem. So, by controlling the light levels, stabilizing relative humidity, and keeping an eye out for insects and fungi, you can reduce greatly the environmental contributions to furniture damage. Which brings us to the second major cause of preventable damage, the way we use and care for our furniture. Obviously, we should be directed by common sense when using furniture we wish to preserve. Here are a few examples. Fire should be kept far from the surface of the object. We should sit only on structures designed for that purpose. Clearly, the drop lid from this desk does not fit that description. Be mindful of what you place on a piece of furniture. 
Organic solvents, such as those in fingernail polish and remover, and alcoholic drinks can behave as paint and varnish removers on many kinds of coatings. While this appears to be a gathering of conviviality, it is, from the furniture's perspective, a paint-stripping party waiting to happen. Hot items, such as coffee mugs and steaming terrines and irons, can literally melt a finish away. Water, from spills, vases, and cold drink glasses, can damage and deface coatings through blooming, an effect that makes transparent coatings white or milky. This problem can be even worse when the liquid itself stains the surface, such as when coffee or tea is spilled, or if the coating is penetrated and the staining liquid enters the wood itself. Ink and other staining materials should be used with caution. These problems are simple to resolve. Using writing pads, oversized ashtrays, and coasters under beverage containers can virtually eliminate the damage. In addition to using furniture wisely, it's important to handle and lift it carefully. Except when handling metal hardware, do not wear gloves, because they can cause you to lose your grip. Remove all jewelry, etc., that could scratch the furniture. And since you are using bare hands when moving furniture, make sure they are clean. Before picking up a piece of furniture, it is critical to first determine how the piece is constructed, what parts of it are removable or detachable. Without doing so, furniture can be seriously damaged through ill-advised handling. Let's look at some examples of moving furniture properly. When moving this drop leaf table, determine which support members move. Is it simply a bracket or a swing leg? Fold the leaves down and restrain them with padding and a tie band. If the support is provided by a swing or gate leg, tie it in place as well. The only safe place to grab a drop leaf table is underneath the end aprons. Grabbing by the legs, especially swing legs, will increase the chance of damage to them. And grabbing by the side leaves will often result in fracturing the long rule joint that allows the leaves to drop. Picking the table up by lifting on the top rather than the apron may break the glue blocks that hold the top to the frame or strip out the screws which hold the top on. When lifting a chair, go through the same steps. Especially important is to realize that the back is not the strongest part of a chair. The seat rail is. For small chairs, lift by the side seat rails one hand near the front, the other near the rear. Frequent lifting by the back, especially the crest rail, will eventually result in the breaking of that element. When lifting a large chair or sofa, the rules are the same. Grab underneath the side frame, being sure to lift with your legs rather than your back. While case pieces, especially large ones, may appear very different than tables and chairs, the same rules apply. Again, how was it put together and how can it come apart? Anytime the furniture has handles with loose or swinging parts, wrap them with padding. This protects the handles, the furniture surface, the movers, and the surroundings in case you bump up against anything. If the carcass is sturdy enough, remove the drawers to lighten the load. Move the drawers separately to the destination. If the drawers provide necessary rigidity to the object, they must be left in place to avoid the twisting stresses that are almost inevitable in moving. While the case piece can be moved similarly to tables and chairs, that is, carrying it carefully by...